Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and we are so glad to see you here this afternoon. We know that it is another very, very busy day here on Capitol Hill, and that there are votes going on uh, all afternoon on both the House and the Senate side. So, But we're very, very glad that you are here for this discussion this afternoon, which we think is a very interesting and exciting and timely topic as energy policy is looked at um, on both sides of the hill and as it has become increasingly clear how critical it is to really think about our energy use, the kind of energy, how it is used, how we can provide the greatest amount of resilience, reliability into our systems, as well as obviously dealing with highly efficient systems that use as little energy as possible and that are economic, that really truly make a solid business case. And so we are very glad to have this discussion this afternoon. It follows a, a briefing that we did on May 8th that was looking at the whole role of district energy, combined heat and power in microgrids, and how they contribute to um, improved resilience as well as uh, solid economics and energy policy. And today we are going to be zeroing in even further to really look at combined heat and power at CHP and how CHP helps us and our businesses and our communities save money, reduce emissions, and improve energy security or energy resilience. This has become such an important issue as we've looked at more and more concerns about um, power outages as the country faces more and more, um, or so it seems anyway, extreme weather events that result in power outages for one reason or another. So we have a panel today that is going to tell the story of combined heat and power, taking us from a national picture in terms of what uh, it looks like and providing a national analysis uh, and background information to hearing about the programs that are available through EPA, through the Environmental Protection Agency, and then looking down at uh, a regional level and at a company level um, as, as we really look at the story of CHP. So thank you again for being here, and I am very uh, pleased to uh, turn the microphone over now to our first presenter, Anne Hampson, who is a senior associate with ICF International, and ICF has been working on combined heat and power issues and doing much monitoring and analysis for years, and um, I think we all depend upon them for uh, having kind of the latest in very, very important data uh, with regard to CHP. Ann? All right, hi, I'm Ann Hampson from ICF, as uh, Carol just said. We'll give it a second for the slides to to come up. Uh, basically, I'm going to be giving kind of more of just a general overview of CHP and what it is uh, to really set the stage and the context for several of the other speakers uh, and giving a, a picture of where, um, where the CHP market is currently and what kinds of trends we see coming up in the future. Great. Uh, Many of you may have seen this first chart. Uh, you know, when we talk about power generation and power production in the U.S., uh, there's a huge amount of heat that's wasted during that uh, central station power generation. Uh, you can see towards the left of the graph the energy, uh, you know, as fuel that's going in to uh, the whole energy system, and the amount, it's almost two-thirds that is coming out as uh, losses due to, to heat. Um, or it's, you know, usually power plants are set next to rivers or lakes or have cooling towers, you know, to, to get all that heat away. But combined heat and power is really saying, we want to use that heat for a useful process and not let it just be thrown away, and therefore we can be a lot more energy efficient. Um, combined heat and power is 
not a uh, one specific technology. It's really uh, an integrated energy system. So you can use a, a variety of different types of uh, generation technologies for CHP. Uh, as long as um, you're you know, generating electricity and then also using the byproduct heat for a useful purpose, we would consider that to be CHP. Um, you know, in any electrical generation process, you're going to generate heat. And so you can use that heat for things like space heating, water heating. Um, a lot of industrial plants have a lot of steam process needs. You can even use heat for cooling, which sounds a little counterintuitive, but uh, through absorption chillers and other types of technologies like that, you can provide um, space conditioning uh, needs through the use of, of waste heat. Uh, CHP systems are also uh, typically located either at or right next door to the uh, facility where their energy outputs are being used. So that really cuts down on transmission and distribution losses. Uh, and so it really makes the system to be uh, more efficient and, and kind of more localized. Um, and then it's also, uh, you know, there's kind of going back and forth between CHP. Is it CHP or cogeneration? It's both. You know, um, those words are synonyms for each other, and so we don't want anybody to be uh, confused at them. Uh, there are two main types of CHP systems. Uh, there's one that's called a topping cycle, and what we refer to as conventional CHP. Uh, through the diagram, you can see that fuel is going into a prime mover um, and creating electricity, whereas there's um, waste heat that's going up to a heat recovery steam boiler and uh, comes out and can be used uh, for uh, you know, any kind of process needs, whether that would be still in steam or hot water. Uh, you know, at an industrial facility, they could use that, that steam for process needs. At a hospital, there's a lot of you know, laundry uh, needs. There's a lot of sterilization and hot water needs. So you know, whether it's an industrial or a commercial facility, there's usually a lot of uh, thermal usage that's needed. Um, this next type of CHP called waste heat to power uh, is also referred to as a bottoming cycle CHP system. It differs that instead of um, basically generating electricity first, you're generating heat first in um, kind of a, an energy intensive process, either you know, in uh, you know, steel and iron plants in a big metals furnace or uh, in some type of industrial kiln. And then once uh, that heat has, has done its job for your production, you can um, you know, channel it through a, a steam turbine and create additional electricity. Uh, so basically, you know, there, there are two kind of types of CHP, but overall, we really just look at it as you put in one fuel source and you get two outputs. So both of those, those types of system you know, have that, that ratio of one, one fuel stream in, two things out. Um, these are just a couple pictures of CHP systems. Uh, they really can vary in size and, and type. Uh, the pictures are, are fairly little, but you can see in the top industrial system, the size of those people um, are pretty small. So, you know, some of the, the industrial sized turbines and, and boilers can be pretty large, um, especially getting to utility size systems. Um, but also uh, commercial and even, you know, residential CHP is possible, uh, you know, with something you could see fitting in your home. Um, that's not a huge market in the U.S. yet, but uh, it might be in the future. Uh, so, you know, it can, CHP can be at pretty much any size down to, you know, five kilowatts up to 500 megawatts. Uh, so CHP provides a lot of different benefits. Uh, I think one of the uh, main things that we've already been talking about is the, the way that it's very uh, thermally efficient, you know, using both the electrical output and then using the, the heat for a useful process. And um, through that uh, efficiency, for the uh, site that's actually using the system, you know, if they're using less energy, that translates into less energy cost, which can be a, a very big deal. Uh, most of the CHP systems that we see going in are, are really going in because of uh, the fact that it can save manufacturers or save hospitals or, or universities a significant amount of money. Uh, you know, it, but through that added efficiency, it also reduces emissions. So, uh, you know, along with uh, you know, saving money, you're also not emitting as much, which can help in, you know, permitting processes. And I'm thankful for it when I breathe air that's not, you know, contaminated. So that's, you know, important to everyone. 
Uh, but another thing that we're going to be really focusing in on on this panel too is CHP and how it can be used for reliability. Uh, you know, we've seen um, a lot of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, large weather events like Hurricane Sandy in, in the fall that have really knocked out the electric grid uh, for long periods of time. And, uh, you know, it really becomes uh, quite an issue about how people are going to be able to, you know, maintain, um, you know, water and, and just, you know, be able to have, uh, some, you know, uh, shelter and places to be. And so CHP can provide a reliable uh, fuel source at the actual facility. So there's going to be um, some case studies today, but also, you know, um, there's a, a report that was recently put out that I'll also have a, a link to later in the presentation talking about how specific hospitals or nursing homes were able to continue all of their services just like nothing happened, whereas right down the street, you know, during um, Sandy and the aftermath, you know, people were, were without power for days. Uh, and then CHP can also help reduce grid congestion. There are a lot of areas uh, in the country, especially around cities, especially in uh, New York City, uh, if you hear about a lot of the grid constraints that they're under. And so, you know, there's not, uh, there's a lot of, you know, electricity and, and energy users right in a small area, and it's hard to always have uh, as much transmission and distribution infrastructure to put in, you know, to bring more generation into the area. And so strategically placed, uh, CHP can really help uh, you know, be able to defer really costly improvements in transmission and distribution. Uh, this graph is basically showing the, uh, the efficiency uh, benefits of CHP. Uh, on the left side, you have, uh, you know, kind of a, a conventional, um, you know, electricity from a power plant and, you know, fuel coming from a boiler or, or your thermal energy coming from a boiler on site. Uh, and then on the right side, you look at the CHP system, which instead of having, you know, electricity just from the power plant and fuel in the boiler, you're putting, you know, fuel into the, the CHP plant and you're providing both of those same outputs. Uh, so for, you know, to get the same output, you're using less fuel, um, only 100 units of fuel on the CHP side versus 147. So that translates into um, a difference of, of almost 25% uh, in terms of efficiency, which, again, can save a lot of money. This is basically the same chart with the same concept, only on the emissions side. So you can see how it actually uh, impacts emissions. So this is based on uh, CO2. And so you can see that there's almost half uh, the amount of CO2 emissions released for the CHP system versus the separate heat and power. So this pie chart really shows where CHP is um, installed in the U.S. today. Uh, if you can, you know, see a lot of the big, um, big portions of, of the pie chart are in a lot of uh, large industrial uh, applications like chemicals, refining, paper, food processing. Um, and so CHP, there's about uh, 82 gigawatts in the country today over, at over 4,000 sites. But most of those uh, facilities or most of that capacity is actually at industrial facilities, which have traditionally, you know, been able to use CHP, uh, you know, very well. And it, it fits in with a lot of their, um, you know, kind of natural inclinations for, uh, for energy use. Um, however, you'll see that there's about 13% in commercial and industrial or in institutional. And uh, we're really seeing a lot of growth in that area uh, for the future. So. Um, it's kind of <clears throat> not as much in the current capacity right now, but it's definitely uh, a more of an up-and-coming area. And uh, overall, you can see that there's 1.8 quadrillion BTUs of, of energy saved. That's a huge amount of money uh, that's being saved by the, the plants that have uh, CHP. And over 241 million metric tons of uh, CO2 are being saved per year just by sites that are already operating right now. Uh, CHP systems, there really is no uh, geographic barriers. They're installed all over the country. Uh, they tend to be, you know, you can kind of see they gravitate towards population centers because where the people are, there's are the, the sites and the, the facilities that can actually make use of this. But there are no, um, you know, some renewables you can see are, are much better in certain parts of the country than others, whereas CHP, uh, you can do it anywhere, and uh, you know it can really be beneficial uh, regardless of any geographic issues. 
Uh, this chart shows the amount of CHP that's gone in per year um, starting in 1960. Uh, so you can see that it's been a little bit of a roller coaster. We've had um, you know, a fairly steady amount of, of CHP uh, for a long time. And then in the 80s, uh, after the uh, implementation of PURPA, the Public Utilities Regulatory Policy Act, uh, came in, it allowed a lot of, um, you know, kind of opened up the market for uh, CHP facilities that were able to become qualified facilities to sell into the electricity markets. So a lot of growth happened during that time. Um, and you can see that fairly recently in 2006, there was a really big drop off. Uh, that corresponds to times when we had really volatile natural gas prices. Uh, natural gas is the primary fuel for most CHP systems. It also corresponds with times when uh, some of the uh, benefits from PURPA expired, and so uh, they didn't have as much of a, an ability to um, you know, sell into electricity markets. But you know, even though uh, you know, that hasn't, we haven't seen the, the very high growth numbers. There actually has been a steady amount of growth recently in um, on-site systems that are being used at a facility that are sized in order to provide that facility's uh, electricity and, and thermal needs, rather than being sized uh, to be able to export electricity to the grid. Uh, we are seeing a lot of emerging drivers for CHP. Uh, one of them is uh, just the support that federal and state policymakers are, are giving to CHP, you know, looking at uh, industrial energy efficiency and, and having some goals uh, towards that, that end. Last year in August, there was a, an executive order uh, released by the White House that uh, set a goal for uh, 20 or no, 40 gigawatts of uh, additional CHP by 2020. And um, there's also been a lot of increased state interest. Uh, we've also seen a, a fairly large, uh, you know, kind of a, what we call a game changer in terms of natural gas supply and price. So there's a lot more uh, supply of natural gas. Prices are looking really steady, and so it's looking like um, a really good uh, investment driver. And then also there are some environmental drivers that are going on looking at being able to reduce emissions. So with all of those things combined, you know, one of the things that ICF does is maintain a database of CHP facilities uh, throughout the country. That's where we got that map from earlier. But you'll see that even though, you know, towards the beginning of the 2000s, there was a decrease in installed capacity, we're actually tracking facilities, you know, that are, uh, have been publicized as either being in development or under construction over the next couple years. And so we are seeing an increase in the amount of CHP that's been announced. Uh, one of the things that we're encouraged about is that there has been a lot that's been announced and mo a lot of systems don't get announced at all. So we're even considering that those figures uh, looking towards the future are pretty conservative and that there will be a lot more facilities that we don't even know about yet. Um, I'm going to kind of go through this one really quick. So we already talked a little bit about the uh, reliability and resiliency benefits that CHP can provide. And, you know, really when looking at things like when Hurricane Sandy came and, you know, I, I think a lot of you may remember the, the pictures of the New York University Hospital having to take babies out uh, and, and take them to other facilities because their backup generators weren't able to provide them with electricity and keep the facility going. Uh, CHP is, is, you know, typically it's installed, it's operating every day, it's very highly maintained. Um, the likelihood of you getting into an emergency situation and your CHP system not being able to work uh, is, very, is very unlikely, whereas, you know, it, it's relatively common to see emergency generators not be able to, um, to pick up and, and continue that load. Uh, this is the report that uh, we're going to be talking about a little more. Uh, it's the, uh, I guess what, combined heat and power enabling resilient energy infrastructure for critical facilities. And so it has a lot of uh, additional information on how to design a CHP system for reliability. It has 14 case studies in it that have both industrial and commercial uh, applications and how they were able to ride through either Hurricane Sandy or a couple of them are uh, case studies about riding through other power outage events. Uh, so that, uh, and there's a URL for that uh, report. 
So uh, kind of in closing, we're going to look at, at a couple of pictures of the um, potential for growth in uh, CHP. This is a map that shows the states in, in dark uh, blue with the highest uh, additional capacity for CHP. Those are facilities that are currently installed uh, or facilities that are currently uh, you know, built that don't have CHP that would have uh, energy loads likely to make CHP work. Uh, and this is basically the same figures just by application. So you can see that uh, the blue part of the bar is existing CHP capacity, whereas the kind of neon greenish is the uh, remaining CHP technical potential. So several of the large industrial uh, categories that have a lot of installed uh, CHP, they also have a lot of room for growth. Uh, and then there's a lot of growth in the commercial applications as well. So this is basically in summary, um, you know, we think that CHP provides a lot of benefits both for the actual energy user and for the whole nation. So mainly at, at, on the energy uh, user side, the main thing is you're, you're saving a lot of money using this, um, depending on, on the energy rates and where you are in the country. Uh, but you can also really ride through grid uh, distri ugh, disruptions. And uh, you, know, you can have more of a hedge and, and provide some stability by being able to generate your own power and your own thermal energy on site rather than relying on the electric grid. Uh, and then benefits to the nation, you know, having the increased energy efficiency uh, really reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, most CHP is also uh, natural gas fueled, and so it can take uh, or can use, you know, this kind of domestic energy source. It's not typically relying on, on foreign energy sources. And uh, it can really put to work uh, a lot of, you know, um, a lot of the, the systems are manufactured in the U.S., and so it can put uh, Americans to work, you know, both building and constructing these facilities and then also maintaining them going forward. Uh, I had a question slide, but I think questions are at the end, so uh, you can go ahead and pass it over. Uh, that was a great um, uh, context setting for CHP and uh, covered a lot of solid information, which was terrific. Uh, so we will now turn to Susan Wickwire, who is the Chief of the Energy Supply and Industry Branch at the Climate Protection Partnerships Division at EPA, at the Environmental Protection Agency. And of course, I really do think that EPA should do something about shortening all of these long names. But anyway, <laughs> my, my, big, my big recommendation, right? Um, but Susan is going to talk a little bit about EPA's perspective in terms of the kinds of information that they have available and, uh, and the voluntary programs that, that they have with regard to companies and other facilities that have been working on CHP. And of course, if you haven't looked, the EPA website contains a wealth of information in this whole area that I think is very, very useful for all of us. Susan? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to Carol for the invitation to uh, share what's going on at EPA. And also, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on more broadly in the federal government. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, uh, I'm at EPA. I manage a group that has the CHP partnership. We also promote renewable energy through the Green Power Partnership, and we have resources and tools for corporate greenhouse gas management. So we're on the voluntary side in the in the air office in the climate area, um, and we also are in the shadow of our larger, better known uh, uh, partnership program, the Energy Star program. So we work closely with them on a lot of these programs, which I'll be getting into. This slide has some information about what's going on more broadly at the federal level, and I think many of you are probably already familiar with the executive order, so I didn't go through all the different elements to it, but I would just note a few important aspects, uh, one of which was just having an executive order was a big boost to CHP. Um, I've been working on the issue, <clears throat> excuse me, for five years or so, and many have been working on the issue much longer, and nothing of this sort of magnitude or signal had been sent, you know, from the highest levels in the in the government. So that was something that, you know, was really well received and I think we're we're just still sort of realizing all the potential that that has and you know in in 
planning the work that we're doing and kind of seeing what the opportunities are. And so that's something that, you know, we're obviously looking to advance and, and looking for feedback from people about how we can even do a better job of that. But so the executive order had a number of different elements. Um, I'll just highlight a couple. Um, one of them was for EPA to help states look at how CHP and other efficiency measures and even renewable energy, and that could be CHP uh, as well, um, could, could use um, these measures in their state implementation plan. So if you're going to have to comply with national ambient air quality standards, how can you use these measures, which you know, may be more cost effective than other compliance measures? So as part of the executive order, EPA was tasked with the, with the uh, role or the responsibility of working with the states on these types of issues. Um, the executive order also tasked DOE with looking at its Better Buildings, Better Plants program that's already in place, that's looking to raise efficiency levels uh, over a 10-year period and seeing how CHP could be promoted in that context. So, you know, sort of taking something that's, that's, that's ongoing or isn't existing, but just say, hey, we want to take a look at CHP in this, in this context. So that's kind of in a nutshell the executive order. There's that 40 gigawatt goal that Ann mentioned, which is obviously important. Um, that we're, you know, sort of a longer term, but I'm going to focus on the, on the near term here. Um, so I, I just put in a couple of the activities that, of note, the DOE is undertaking to support the executive order and, and CHP more broadly. Um, they've already organized several uh, regional dialogues around the country, um, Little Rock, Arkansas, and Columbus, Ohio, and uh, Baltimore most recently, and I just hear that they're going to be out in uh, Salt Lake City at the end of October, so kind of stay tuned for that. So that'll be the Western version of it. But really, to go to the states, the regions, where you can look at the issues there, what's affecting the CHP market, what could, what could help um, incentivize CHP and industrial energy efficiency investments even more broadly. But so it's really just getting out of Washington, seeing what's out there. We hear about you know different um, policies, incentive, you know activities going on, but it's important to engage stakeholders where they are and kind of hear their stories and see how that will inform better policy making and program delivery in in Washington. Um, they also have their clean application, clean energy application centers around the country, which also gives them a regional pr uh, profile and, again, can address um, the needs at the regional level, and they provide a lot of technical assistance through those. And they're also working at the policy level with the National Governors Association. They chose, in concert with, with you know, different, different offices around the governor's offices, you know, f I think it's five states uh, where CHP may have some traction, but, but having these kind of engagements will actually propel CHP forward even more. So that's something that's um, underway, and I think there'll be some results of that engagement and, and partnership very soon. And then Ann mentioned the report on the resilient um, infrastructure uh, that we'll hear more about later. Um, I also just would actually want to touch upon the cooperation that we have with DOE. Um, you know, we, we have our, you know, responsibilities, they have theirs, but, you know, a lot of times it makes sense for us to get together and, and, and put out joint reports. Um, we, we, you know, engage stakeholders jointly, um, but I just draw attention to this guide for successful imp implementation of state CHP policies. This was really, I think, the first effort to bring in one sort of document kind of, uh, you know, for, for people in states, you know, not just do it from the Washington perspective, but say, these are important issues, this is how you can think about these issues, and here are some examples of, of where success has been achieved and, you know, some lessons learned that you might be able to apply in your situation. So I would just draw your attention to that. Um, now I'm going to shift gears to focus on uh, what EPA is doing. Um, we have the CHP partnership, which I'll get into, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Energy Star Industrial Program. Um, they work with 24 different sectors and provide a lot of good resources for energy management, um, benchmarking tools, um, energy performance indicators. So they, they play a big role and we work with them to um, leverage their resources, the Energy Star reach, um, to get the CHP word out. So I think a lot of you, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, um, are familiar with the, with the CHP partnership, but I thought it would be useful just to kind of put up our latest stats in terms of how many projects we've been helping through how many partners we have in the partnership. But it's, it's, it's really about what EPA, with our 
um, experience and perspective can bring to the to the um, to the CHP market, and we really try to target our efforts very strategically, and we look at the barriers that are out there. Um, so we gear the work that we're doing to the barriers, and I'll I'll be getting into that in my subsequent slides. But so we develop tools, resources, make them available on our website. Uh, you know, we really appreciate feedback from users to say, yeah, this was really helpful, or maybe you guys can think about this, or if only your, your calculator would give us this you know, gas, we don't have that yet, or something. But, um, but I think that's something that, that you know, we put out there for people to use very broadly, so it's just broader than our, our partners. Um, we also have our Energy Star CHP Award, where we recognize um, superior performing systems. And that really does shine a very high spotlight. We get a press release. We get on the EPA you know, website. We, you know, newspapers pick it up. And I think it's a way to say that there are, even among CHP systems, those that are operating at a higher level and, and can be recognized in this way. And I'll be getting into a little bit more about how we support the executive order through some of our efforts. Um, so you heard a lot about the benefits of CHP from, from Ann. So I'm not going to kind of go through the benefits. I thought what might be more interesting was to say sort of why can't we capture all the benefits? And if we're looking at these barriers to achieving the benefits, then how is EPA uh, geared toward addressing, um, you know, or overcoming those barriers to these, getting these benefits? So on the environmental front, which is, you know, our area of expertise, of course, um, you know, the emission reductions that you're going to get a lot of times occur off-site. In fact, your on-site emissions are maybe going to go up because you're going to increase the, you know, production of electricity that you might have been previously been buying. And unfortunately, the Clean Air Act was written many years ago, has been amended, but it, it doesn't really count emission avo emissions avoided off-site in terms of your um, compliance. And so that's just a, a limitation that, that is there. But that's not to say that there are, you know, ways that we can, we can try to um, incentivize or, or give CHP some um, credit. And that's the, the second thing that I've listed, listed is this traditional air permitting looks at input-based fuel to determine the limit that your facility has in terms of emissions, as opposed to looking at your productive output, your thermal and your electricity output. And so that's something that, um, as you can see what we're doing, we're trying to, to change that paradigm. We're working with um, folks inside of EPA that write the rules on our regulatory side. We're working with state permitting officials so that they're aware that there are other ways to do this, new ways that um, may not be, you know, really hard, that they could actually do them. I mean, it, um, and they, you know, to be there, you know, they're, one thing we've recognized is there are, you know, resource constraints out in, in these state um, governments, I mean, with, you know, budget cuts and everything, that they've got a lot going on and a lot of requirements. But so we're making it our job to educate them about CHP and how these systems can be permitted and maybe a, in a different way. And I would also just note that um, we have this emissions calculator, which is, is adding to the, the transparency, you know, helping systems say, you know, it's, whether it's a, an existing system or a prospective system, you know, these are the emission benefits that you can estimate from this system you know, by comparing those emissions to what's on the grid. And so you're, you're displacing those emissions. I think Ann also ably went through the economic benefits. Um, I think, you know, really the upfront capital costs can be a barrier. Um, you know, there's some utility policies and practices and, and state practices, not just the utilities, but they're following practices that aren't necessarily conducive to the project economics. Different rates that they might have to pay are, are, are fairly high. Um, and then we hear often that, you know, if you have a payback period of more than three years, if even that, it might even be less than that, then it's really, you know, challenging to get a project funded within an organization. Um, you know, we're, unfortunately, we're not in a position to, you know, have grants or, you know, give a lot of money away. Um, so we're trying to do the next best thing, which is to publicize incentives that are offered at, at the state level and at the federal level. So we have this, um, we had a, a funding database, but now we've expanded it and just uh, as of today are launching um, we're called DCHIP, because um, we have to have an acronym, Carol, just, um, just for you. Um, but anyway, this is a really a go-to resource, and it's going to be updated regularly, and it's going to um, have these different policies, different incentives that project developers can go to. We're hoping, um, you know, that state officials can go to, for example. So that would be, would be very useful. And I would just also add on that, that last bullet about the, the productive investment. I think that, you know, if, if say uh, a system has to comply with a regulation and maybe wants to think about installing scrubbers or some other sort of, um, you know, environmental or, uh, you know, emission uh, control strategies. 
what CHP gives you is really a productive investment. So over time, you're going to reap the benefits of the, of the you know, reduced energy costs, the increased output. Um, and so it, 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 it really will, you know, can change the, the, the life cycle, if you will, um, economics for a, a project. So that's one thing else we try to point out through some of our material. Well, lastly, I thought I would just touch upon the third theme of this panel, which is on resiliency. And again, I think Anne, you know, noted a lot of the benefits of, of CHP in these situations where you have a crisis or a weather event that's going to affect the grid in a, you know, very negative way. Um, but some things to think about, too. I mean, you, you know, most, you know, guidance says that CHP systems have to be sized to the thermal load. So, you know, you're not going to have sort of a, you know, a, a big generator, you know, because you may or may not be able to sell the, to the grid, which could also affect your, your project economics. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, you also have to be in a proper configuration in order to be able to go into, into island mode. And that adds to your cost, too, unfortunately, up front, that you have to put in additional equipment to make, you know, make that possible. Um, so that's something to, that, that can be a challenge, can be a barrier. Um, and so I think what our role is and, and, and will be is really just saying, you know, yes, there are these costs. Yes, there are these extra, you know, considerations. But what, what are you getting in return for that? And I think, you know, at these critical infrastructure locations like wastewater treatment plants, like medical facilities, you know, all of the benefits are going to outweigh, you know, the, these, these costs up front over time, I mean, not just from a sort of like insurance perspective, but also I think from a monetary perspective that, that the paybacks will be there, you know, but it may take 5, 10 or, or 15 years to, to realize them. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier about the DCHIP, we're uh, raising awareness of the state policies, the guide that we uh, worked on with DOE um, is another place that we try to highlight these. And we also have a partnership with the National Association of State Energy Officials. They have a, a specialized, you know, constituency and, and a real reach to them. And a lot of them are putting in plans and procedures that, you know, will affect the energy infrastructure in their state. So that's a key audience uh, for the messages as well. And so we work with NASIO to achieve those. Um, so in closing, I just, you know, would echo um, Carol's opening sentiment. You know, thank you for coming today. And, um, you know, glad to have a lot of interest in CHP. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Susan. After we've now taken this look at the federal level and what's, what's going on there and in terms of how EPA and DOE are trying to really provide a lot of guidance and assistance to, to states as well as at the um, national facility level, we're now going to take a look at a regional level. And for that, um, we have someone who has probably, uh, who is very, very well equipped to do this, Tom Bourgeois, who is the Deputy Director of the Pace Energy and Climate Center at Pace University. And he has been working on CHP issues for a number of years. And in fact, just a week or so ago, I think, was uh, doing a CHP workshop uh, in New York State, um, and of course, New York has been uh, doing a lot of work on CHP through um, NYSERDA, the research and development agency there for a number of years, seeing it as an extremely important business opportunity as well as important to a lot of, of government agencies in terms of delivery of their own efficient energy uh, services. Tom? Thank you very much, Carol, and um, thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, for those of you not familiar with CHP, I hope that uh, uh, what you're hearing today, that this might be the most exciting uh, energy story that you've never heard. Uh, we believe it's equally as exciting as, all, uh, as the story of our friends in the PV and solar and wind and renewable space. And so I, uh, I hope that's the message we get. And as, as um, Carol was saying, uh, we're pro proceeding from the national uh, level and, and now the regional, that's me, and then down to the company level. Uh, so if this sounds provincial, uh, it is. Um, it's focused on the Northeast. I'm representing uh, the USDOE's Northeast Clean Energy Application Center. I, I also am Deputy Director at PACE. But uh, we have um, eight of these around the country, 
and work closely also with Rob Thornton here at District Energy, uh, International District Energy Association. Uh, so what you're going to hear from, from me is, is the perspective uh, f uh, from the Northeast. And um, several of these have already been covered. Uh, I'm going uh, to look here, looking here at the technical potential for the Northeast, as, as Ann said, existing CHP, the message that Carol asked me to go through, uh, I mean, I, I have more slides than I can possibly do, so I'm going to run pretty quickly, and, and for those of you who want, they'll, I think they'll be at the website. But uh, about seven-eighths of the existing CHP is, is, is in large industrial applications, so what we, I think what we are going to see is that where CHP is today is not where it's likely going to be in the future. Um, where it is today is large industrial, pulp and paper, chemicals, uh, refining, food processing, and so on. Um, but what we have here, uh, we have about 16 gigawatts of pot technical potential in the Northeast. Uh, Ten and a half of that is in the commercial sector, five and a half in industrial. And it's also not in the large size. Uh, if we get large projects, we've been working, hoping to work with, with Rob, and we'll work with Rob, um, perhaps on an area that uh, um, aggregating larger projects in our region would be through multi-building CHP, microgrids, district energy systems with CHP. And uh, we're very excited about that. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that as well. Uh, in terms of the sectors that we're looking at, uh, commercial buildings, multifamily buildings, um, uh, colleges and universities, hospitals, uh, when you look down the list of the, where the technical potential resides in our area, that's, that's where the greatest opportunities are. And uh, through our DOE center, that's, that's, those are the areas that we're, we're really focusing uh, on. Now the message that uh, that Carol asked me to, to try to focus on in my presentation uh, with examples from New York, and I'm going to pep or New York in the Northeast, and I'm going to be peppering you with example uh, examples and cases here is uh, economic, proven, reliable, and clean. So, yeah, you know, CHP. What what problems does it solve? Well, it saves money and it reduces operating costs. It's more predictable, predictable energy uh, costs, a hedge against rising costs. Uh, it's a, a great energy efficiency uh, tool. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, many uh, colleges and universities, hospitals, and other entities that have uh, climate challenge plans, greenhouse gas action plans, and so on, are using CHP as, a, as the centerpiece of that. For example, uh, NYU is uh, obtaining about uh, five-eighths of their greenhouse gas uh, emissions in the first 10 years of the plan are through CHP, and about 30, 33 percent over the entire course of the plan are through CHP. And finally, the resiliency message, following Superstorm Sandy, uh, we've been talking about this, Rob, others uh, have been talking about this for years, but this resiliency reliability has really hit home to people post Superstorm Sandy, uh, Hurricane Irene, and the October 2011 snowstorm in the Northeast. Uh, it's a, CHP's ability for critical infrastructure resiliency, business continuity, and emergency preparedness and planning. So, theme, CHP saves money. CHP was seen as the greatest uh, single opportunity to reduce utility costs at New York Presbyterian Cornell Weill campus. Uh, going across the border to UMass, UMass Medical Center is expecting a payback of less than three years on their system, 6.2 million in annual savings. South Oaks Hospital, Amityville, Long Island, is saving nearly 540,000 a year on a 1.4 uh, uh, million energy bill. Uh, Montefiore Hospital uh, reported uh, the, a, a five-year payback on their 5.5 megawatt solar turbines uh, system there. So CHP is, is saving money. Uh, efficiency. Well-designed CHP is highly efficient. The UMass Medical Center's system is operating at an 86% total system efficiency. New York Presbyterian operating at 85 percent. At full load, South Oaks Hospital CHP system operates at 88 percent efficiency. Um, CHP, again, the message here is energy efficiency. Well, this, this is energy efficiency. It's, a, it's a, a spectacular energy efficiency tool. Unfortunately, and I'm going to touch on this later, um, a lot of states run energy efficiency programs, but CHP falls through the cracks. It doesn't have a home in the energy efficiency programs. It doesn't have a home in the renewables programs. And consequently, it doesn't receive the same level of incentives uh, that, that many other technologies do get. CHP uh, markedly improves reliability. Um, 
uh, New York Presbyterian system provides 100% redundancy to its entire inpatient areas. Um, the UMass Medical Center system permits the campus to operate with virtually no supplemental grid power. The UMass Amherst uh, campus ran uh, through the October 2011 storm uh, without, without a loss of power, uh, keeping critical facilities operating, operating the dorms, operating uh, research labs, and this is of critical importance. Uh, uh, the, the, the cost of lost research is, is invaluable, uh, tens of millions, and sometimes you can't even put a price on it. So uh, th that reliability for, for the research facilities is, is absolutely essential. Um, <clears throat> CHP versus backup generation. Well, one thing we found uh, in, in uh, r recent storms going back to even the August 2003, we, there was a retrospective done on the August 2003 blackout. And uh, we found that more than half of the hospitals in New York City, for example, the emergency generating systems there did not perform as specified. That uh, uh, they would, uh, some of them turned on but went off after a few hours, some of them didn't come on at all. Um, uh, NYSERDA tells a story about uh, the Saratoga um, uh, Corrections Facility, which the day before this event was August 14th, uh, in, in 2003, the day before, it had tested as generators, the emergency backups, they passed uh, without a hitch, and then the next day they didn't operate, the, and the correction facility was dark throughout the blackout. So CHP provides a continuous benefit. It's, it's uh, operating all the time. It's well maintained. You know, uh, the, those who run it know how it operates. It's, uh, it, you have, it gives you daily operating cost savings, unlike uh, emergency backup generators, which are essentially a dead asset, an insurance policy. You buy it and hope you don't use it. Um, and you know, again, CHP can offset capital costs associated with investments in traditional backup. Many states don't allow you to use this uh, for life safety, but you can certainly use it as a supplement. And a lot of uh, institutions uh, are, are using what they call comfort power or, or subsidiary power and putting uh, CHP on um, to take care of those loads. CHP reducing emissions and CO2, again, um, UMass Medical Center, net annual greenhouse gas reductions, uh, over 41,000 tons per year reduced. Uh, New York Presbyterian, 27,000 tons per year. South Oaks Hospital reduced their carbon footprint <clears throat> by uh, greater than 1,900 tons per year. Knox was reduced by 95% from 110,000 tons per year to uh, under, just under 6,000 tons in 2012. And it allowed the hospital to move from a major source permit to a, a minor source. Um, again, I, as I said at the outset here, I'm, I'm representing the Northeast, so this is a, a bit of a provincial uh, um, look, but uh, we believe we're a great area to do business for CHP, and uh, I think the facts bear this out. We took a look at the, the uh, ICF CHP database. Uh, of the new installations over the last five years, or the, through, through the period uh, 2007 to 2011, the top four states, you'll see California was first, but our region, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, ranked two, three, and four. Uh, what are some of the favorable characteristics for CHP applications? Well, concern about energy costs, stabilizing your energy costs, providing a hedge against rising costs, concern about reliability, sustainability, and environmental impacts, having long hours of operation, having some existing thermal loads, and having a simultaneity between the electric and thermal demands, having existing central heating and cooling plant. Um, and uh, that last bullet, uh, facility energy champion, is of course a very important one as well. In the Northeast, uh, factors favoring uh, CHP, we have high prices, high electric prices, making these uh, economic investments, low gas prices and expectations for that, and significant additional incentives. Uh, some of these factors were already mentioned, so I'm going to skip by this, some of the de uh, deterrents. Uh, I think this slide is important and something that we have to uh, have yet to figure out that uh, we do have energy savings. We have a tremendous story to tell, just a great story, but uh, we do have to be able to get to the point where the specifying and procuring and financing and installing and operating and maintaining these cannot be a lot more challenging or any more challenging than the status quo alternative. We still have some transaction costs. We still have some new markets to develop, but I think we're, we're moving very quickly there. Uh, we have a lot of incentives in the Northeast. Some of them are quite unique and I think quite exciting and, and perhaps could be replicated elsewhere. Um, 
for example, I mentioned the uh, Mass Save program, energy efficiency. They allow energy efficiency in their, C in their uh, I mean, they allow CHP in their energy efficiency program, can qualify for up to $750 per kW. Uh, they also have a, a CHP uh, REC type instrument, an alternative portfolio standard with alternative energy credits. Both of these are pretty unique around the country and, and worth taking a look at. New York has a catalog program, which they've just brought to market. I think this is pretty exciting, pre-approved, pre-qualified. Again, reducing those transaction costs, making that specifying, procuring, installing uh, a lot easier. And also NYSERDA wants to ensure that these systems run through blackouts. So they require that. They require that uh, resiliency be built right in. Uh, they just announced a similar program for the systems greater than 1.3 megawatts. Anne was mentioning uh, congestion costs. Also, you get paid bonuses if you locate in, in areas on the distribution system where this provides congestion relief. We think this is important because it creates benefits for all the rate payers. Everybody benefits and the utility benefits in that instance. Connecticut has an exciting microgrid uh, loan program, district energy systems and microgrids. Uh, with CHP, we think are a ex very exciting new area to explore. The state's going to award 15 million this year, and Governor Malloy has looked to 30 million uh, for the next year. 28 projects are currently under review. Um, uh, they will be decided on June 4th. Uh, this is a, a schematic of one of them, the, the Hartford uh, Parkville cluster with 550 kW of new CHP for a school, senior center, and library. Um, very quickly, concluding with just a couple of case studies, we recently did a case study on, on this project. We think it's a spectacular one, nursing home and hospital on a single campus. Um, they have, during the blackout of August 2003, they never lost power. During Hurricane Sandy, this operated continuously 15 days. Your emergency generators are highly unlikely to do that, carry you through 15 days. Uh, isolated from the grid, providing full power and thermal energy to the hospital, the nursing home, and in taking in uh, patients from nearby. Um, again, the UMass Medical Center, we think is another spectacular example. We have a lot of case studies up at our, our DOE site. We'd welcome you to take a look at that. And finally, um, we are representing the SEACs. We provide uh, technical, economic, financial analysis, uh, support for projects. We're in every state in the country. There's one in your state. Uh, we cover New York and New England. I, um, I do so with my partner, Dr. Becca Kasanovic, Professor of Mechanical Engineering at UMass Amherst. I thank you for the opportunity to speak and look forward to your questions. I hope I got that in in 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, so Tom, you get an award for racing through a huge volume of, of information, but it really is fascinating. And when you look at what is going on and the, the stories behind um, all of these examples and everything, so I think everybody has handouts and all of this information will be up on our website um, as well. So. Um, it's really, really incredible what's happening in the Northeast. Uh, we will now, in terms of looking at, at a story behind um, a, a private company in terms of what really, uh, how, how companies look at this issue in terms of making decisions about what it is that they're going to do, what makes the most sense for them when they are involved in having to make hard business decisions uh, with regard to manufacturing and production and to uh, tell us a story behind their company and CHP is Bob Arujo, who is the Manager for Sustainable Development Environment uh, in Health and Safety for Sikorsky Helicopter. Bob? Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, one, a great company and a great opportunity. Um, Sikorsky Aircraft was founded by Igor Sikorsky. The reason I bring this up is Igor was an innovator. He was told that he would never build a vertical flight device and he built the first helicopter. And we take that legacy as an innovator and we bring that every day into our company. As we look at Sikorsky Aircraft, the Black Hawk, the Seahawk, the R, the S, the M, the 53K, the 53E, the S76, the 92, just some of the products that we have flying every day, every minute. Igor's idea was that we would save lives. 
That's all he wanted to do was save lives. And as we walk in every day, there's a ticker of how many lives we saved. And in 2012, our product saved over 2,000 lives. So if every day you walk into work and you say, what motivates me? It's that maybe that next day, we'll see that ticker move up every single day. So with that spirit, it takes technologists, it takes the best of the best in the world, and it takes a company with a sustainable vision. And Sikorsky Aircraft operates its, bu its business as a sustainable company. So we looked at how do we change our products, how do we change our processes, how do we change our operations to make sure that we were operating within Igor's vision and a sustainable company. We look at the materials on our products every single day, change those out. We look at the processes that we have and we change those out. We want to be the best of the best. We're the largest, in the, uh, we're the largest helicopter manufacturer. So when we looked at our energy and our energy programs, we undertook an engineering study the same way we would change a process. And our engineering study looked at our Sikorsky Stratford, Connecticut facility, 3 million square feet, 9,000 employees, operates 24 seven. And we said, we have an opportunity. The engineering, the numbers worked and we installed a CHP system. And I remember standing in the boardroom selling this during an economic downturn. And we walked in and said, we want to spend $26 million. And our leadership looked at us and said, you're crazy. But we showed that we had a 3.2 year payback. We were going to save 9,000 tons of CO2 emissions. We were going to be able to hedge our fuel prices. We we're going to stabilize our product cost. And so we started, we embarked on that and the leadership decided that they were going to give us the opportunity to do this. Now, as we travel throughout the world, if I walk into Poland, I speak Polish. If I go into Germany, I speak German. If we go into Brazil or Portugal, I speak Portuguese. When we go into the boardroom, we have to speak business. We have to talk about return on investment. As a scientist, I get excited over the thermodynamics of combined heat and power and, and all of that stuff. But when you walk in, we have to talk about, does it make good business sense? So we installed this system. When we installed the system, after a year and a half of construction, I walked back into the boardroom. And the president said, how did it work? Did we get our return? And I said, we missed our target. And he slammed his hand on the table and he said, I knew it. I said, I missed the 3.2 year payback. I gave you a 2.3 year payback. And instead of $5 million of free cash, just shy of $10 million of free cash. So does it work for us? and 9,000 tons of emissions. If we were applying for our Title V permit, we would fall under our Title V limits, well under our Title V limits. Does it make sense for the company? Absolutely. Our employees, the social aspect, the, the sustainable piece, the social aspect, our employees are excited about it. We employ about 3,000 engineers that want to understand the thermodynamics. Every employee is excited to walk into work saying, we're generating a, with a sustainable process. So in the last year, we were thrown two curveballs. We had a hurricane. And most of the state of Connecticut was out. We did not, our lights did not flicker. 9,000 employees could come to work the next day our, we, we have a Navy command. Our Navy captain, along with uh, our Army officers, along with our uh, company pilots, offered the governor seven Blackhawks for rescue. We kept our airport open. Our radar systems were up. Those employees that didn't have power could charge their cell phones. We opened up all of our, uh, our, our gym uh, they could shower. Our cafeterias offered food to take home. So what did we impact? We didn't impact 9,000 people. We impacted 35,000 people. Everybody was able to do, take something home to their family. 
take water home, take food home, charge their cell phones, communicate, go on the internet, pay their bills, do whatever they had to. And oh, by the way, we didn't interrupt our production. Our manufacturing was still meeting. We still have people, we, we still have a war. We still have to meet those demands. We still met those demands and met our schedule. So we thought that was the curveball. In five feet of snow on my back deck, we stayed up. We lost two of our four feeders, and we stayed up. And again, 9,000 people trudged through the snow to come in. And again, our captain offered seven Blackhawks. Seems like every time, maybe we have to stop having the number seven keep coming up. But every time we have seven ready, something happens. We offered seven aircraft, again, to the state. And we were up seven by 24 and never failed. So we look at it as, this is what a sustainable company does. Do we stop here? Absolutely not. In over a dozen states, we have facilities. We have facilities in six countries. And we're embarking on a program called Project Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yes, I had a chance to name that. <laughs> and I'm not going to sing, I promise. We're looking at every single facility from an engineering perspective. And does CHP work? Absolutely. Is it, st is it stabilizing and saving Sikorsky money? Absolutely. Will we do it again? Absolutely. But I can tell you, the answer is not CHP. The engineering will get you to CHP. When that happens, it works every time. So for Sikorsky Aircraft, this is a success story. We're going to have another success story, and another one, and another one, because the investment is there. <coughs> So we embark on a sustainable program, we change our technologies, we change our materials, we change our systems. We do it every single day. We want the best and the brightest in the world. We know it's hard work and we're not going to stop. And that's why Sikorsky is going to be the best aircraft, we're the safest, safest aircraft and the most sustainable product in the world. Thank you. Okay, Bob, I'm inspired. Um, terrific story, and I must say when, I, I remember a few months ago hearing Governor Malloy speak and uh, talking about all of the catastrophes that had happened in Connecticut since he had become governor, which he probably, I don't think he caused them, but anyway, he's been um, governor through many, many uh, catastrophes, and it's just incredible to think about the record that you guys have established um, in terms of how you have put this whole business together and what that represents. So it, it really is such a terrific example, I think, for all of us here today to hear how sustainability, how the business, how it all comes together and um, in terms of what you're doing. So thank you for telling that very, very powerful story. Um, and our final speaker this afternoon, before we open it up for your questions, is Dale Lauda, who is the executive director of the CHP Association, the Combined Heat and Power Association. And so he will talk a little bit in terms of the uh, industry overall and some of the challenges and, and opportunities. So Dale, welcome. Thank you. I promise to be uh, very brief. It's a uh, difficult following for the nation's experts on uh, CHP. Uh, I just want to say one thing real briefly. One of my favorite lines from the song is, uh, I could talk all night. My mind goes sleepwalking while I'm putting the world to right. And I get very caught up in CHP. I think it's really exciting. I think that CHP is one of the great underappreciated resources uh, in the energy sector. And I really think that it's a rare, special opportunity for all of us in this room to help put the world to right. And I know that sounds overstated, but hopefully in just a few minutes I can show you that it's not. Uh, as Carol said, I'm with the CHP Association, which I encourage you to go to www.chpassociation.org to learn about us. We are the National Trade Association for the CHP industry. Our members include people that manufacture CHP equipment, 
users, industrial folks, and universities, and anyone else that might be related to the CHP industry, including electric utilities. Some of the folks are here in the room, but there may be some companies you might have heard of, General Electric, uh, Resource Dynamics, uh, National Grid, ICF, University of Illinois, and the four C's, I like to think of them, uh, Capstone, Caterpillar, Chevron, and Cummins. And we have others also, but those are some household names that are part of our organization. And it shows the breadth of who we are and our interest in CHP. There's two quick points I want to mention that I think really sum up to me that my, my zeal for it, why I think it's kind of exciting. And one is, can you think of any other issue out there that is a potential solution to, at least in part, environmental matters? Uh, it is a potential critical infrastructure solution, certainly part of it. It provides many U.S. jobs, and it helps on reliability for storms. That's pretty special. That's one product, CHP, that can both help with our reliability in storms and uh, severe weather. It has U.S. jobs. It's a dependable and reliable and for critical infrastructure. And it has an environmental protection component. That alone should be, I, when I hear about that and I learned about that, when I first found out, I thought, why isn't everybody doing it? And, and I think part of it is just, frankly, people just don't know enough about it yet. But it gets even better. The second half is, well, surely there must be some, some impediment. There must be some part of the government or some entity that really opposes CHP. I, that would make sense, right? Because you have all these things going in our favor. Why is it not just universally adopted? Or why is there not legislation every day about how wonderful CHP is? And I thought, well, who, who's against it? Well, let's, let's see. Uh, CEQ? No, they're right on board. They're real big supporters. You talk to anybody at CEQ, they're, they're huge. DOE? No, they're fantastic. They, they have a whole office on CHP and all across the country. They love us. Uh, uh, EPA, they have an entire CHP office. They're here today. They, I've never heard that they say nothing but wonderful things about uh, CHP. Uh, Republicans? No, no, same thing. Everybody I've ever talked to, great, we love it. Democrats, same thing. North, South, East, West. The White House, we even have an executive order supporting this. It, I've never known anything. I used to work for a number of other energy industries. I've never been anywhere, worked for anything, any entity. And I, I can't believe there is any entity, even beyond the energy sector, in anything uh, that's a pu any, the public policy arena that has such universal appeal, bipartisan, bicameral, multi-regional. Everybody likes CHP. I mean, it's how, how, how do you not like it? And so our big struggle, I think, now is just showing you why why it is so wonderful and how we can help you answer any of the questions you might have about it. Uh, to that end, we are always available to answer questions. I, I can't imagine a question that some one of our members wouldn't know the answer to, but if we don't know the answer, we'll be happy to send you to somebody else, either some people at this table or somebody else. So please contact us. And before I close, I want to just mention two other quick things. Tomorrow we're actually having a meeting, and so some of you may know about it, may have heard about it already. If you'd like to learn more about our meeting, tomorrow we're going to have some of the same folks here and a much larger group of panelists. And uh, Matt Wall from the New York Times is going to be speaking. And so we're going to talk about CHP and some of the resiliency issues. If you'd like to learn more about that event tomorrow, please see Winnie Walker right there in the green dress. She will help you and get you there. And with that, I, I would like to close and just say, as we like to say all the time, when we're not quoting Elvis Costello lyrics, uh, CHP is reliable energy delivered efficiently. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, I, before we open up for, um, for, for discussion, just wanted to say, uh, yesterday I was talking briefly to Congressman uh, Tonko from New York State, who is a very big supporter of CHP and, uh, and energy efficiency and renewable energy overall. And he was really, really hoping to be at the briefing this afternoon. I kept expecting him to kind of walk through the door. Um, but um, so he probably is not at this point, but I think that it's also an indication of, of how there are 
um, a lot of people within policy circles that are aware, but there are many, many more who are not aware of what's really involved and what's at stake in terms of looking at this whole role of technology and, and how it can be applied and, and is almost in probably a lot of communities uh, almost kind of a stealth operation where people really don't know uh, in terms of the kinds of services that is being delivered. And so a big question is how do we really um, uh, resolve that and are there barriers that we need to address and where can we um, uh, address them. So let's open it up for your questions now um, or comments. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, my question is for Bob from Sikorsky. Sorry. Um, in some states, it's my understanding that the utilities aren't, you know, real keen on having their largest customers go off the grid and, you know, start generating the power themselves. What was the situation in Connecticut? Um, that's part one. And then part two, do you see this um, uh, new technology or old technology, as the case may be, um, in your peer companies, it has you know the experience of Sikorsky rubbed off on others. There it is. Uh, let me answer your first question. We have an outstanding relationship with the public utilities in uh, in Connecticut. Uh, as a matter of fact, in all of the states that we have a presence in. Uh, as we sat down and and put the program together, uh, they embraced it. Uh, we're 84 percent off the grid uh, in our Stratford, Connecticut facility, and they embraced the, uh, the, the change. What it does for the public utilities, if we doubled our power use, they would have to increase their infrastructure. So are we really taking and helping them avoid a capital investment? Because they wouldn't add 10 megawatts, they would add a thousand. So uh, they they embraced this uh, and and understood that this was this was absolutely the right thing to do. But it was not without discussion. It was not without data. It was not without the proper engineering to just to walk in and say, oh, we're going to do this is is not the approach. It's it's create a good dialogue with the uh, public utilities. Uh, let them uh, discuss the, the engineering and the details and the technical details and you always have a win-win. If it works for you, it works for them. And as far as our peer companies, uh, we've discussed this, uh, the way we look at sustainable development in all of our technology. Uh, I know my counterparts with all of the aerospace industries. We share data all the time. Some of them are looking at it, some of them have started to uh, embrace this, and some of them is, have started to construct. Okay, over here. Mm -hmm. In California, they've been looking at, at they've introduced AB 32, uh, and that seems to have brought a halt to a number of potential CHP installations as the institutions are looking at trying to understand the ramifications of having an on-site power system. What actions or understandings do you all have as to how, that, how to help these institutions work through whether the power prices in the grid will be rising to address these taxes? Do you do um, uh, CO2 emissions? Or, or what other tools do you place to help them still prove out the economics decision? Yes, I, I can speak from, from our Northeast perspective. And we, we would have, I have a counterpart, uh, Tim Lipman um, and Vince McDonald uh, in, in California uh, who would be available. But uh, we do work very closely with projects. We help them with uh, code siting and permitting issues. We help them understand the tariffs, what happens when you uh, put in a CHP system. and. You know, you go from your parent tariff to a standby tariff. We help them model that out. What are the interconnection issues? The interconnection studies that might have to be done. What are the costs going to be if you have to help reinforce the system in, a, in, in your locality due to your, your project? So um, that's part of what the US DOE's Clean Energy Application Center do offer 
to uh, to customers on a on a one to one basis. We do actual technical and economic feasibility studies, but also we we work closely on these utility interface issues, the code siting and permitting issues, um, uh, you know, interconnection, standby tariffs, and so on. And, and we also, uh, we don't advocate, um, but we do try to point to what we consider optimal designs. You know, if some state has, has found a, a way of, of, of approaching a, a standby tariff that seems to be um, uh, 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 more appropriate or acceptable, uh, we try to replicate models around the country. You know, uh, we don't get involved in specific legislation, but we do try to uh, work on best practices and, and optimal incentive designs. Does Anybody that answer else? the question? Or? Uh, well, AB 32 seems to be specifically well, aimed at, at um, uh, CHP. It's a, it's a tax on um, CO2 emissions. So it's, it's a little bit different than I think what we described in terms of tariffs. Yeah, we, I, I, I could not really speak to that because I, I haven't really studied how that would, and we don't have that. We have Reggie, but our, 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 our facilities are not captured under Reggie. Maybe I could just add that in our um, development of that um, policies and incentives database that I just discussed, you know, we had to look at a number of different state energy plans and, and looked at California's, and I was actually surprised that, that they, you know, I mean, they recognize it's a problem. We've heard that from a number of places, um, and I, I think they recognize that that, you know, because of this this on-site off-site issue and the emission reduction potential, um, I think there's an awareness there. Whether they can do anything about it in the short term, but they did indicate in that plan that that was something that they were focused on to try to address in the in, as they evolve their cap and trade program out there. So I think that's something they're sensitive to, but it is an, an issue that um, unfortunately, if, if it's not remedied you know, in the legislation itself. And I think even, you know, in, in Waxman Markey, you know, years ago, um, there was also CHP issues there. So I think it's just a, a perennial problem, but, you know, I think the European Union has come up with some ways to deal with that, and maybe there's some, you know, lessons learned for, for others. But I think it's something they're aware of. It's just, it's just a reality. But it sounds like it's something that whether it's at the national level or state level, that there needs to be some, model language perhaps put together that can help people figure out a, a more appropriate treatment of that so that we don't run into that barrier is what it sounds like you're you're all saying okay um other okay we'll go here first and then back here okay go ahead uh, jennifer Kiefer with the alliance for industrial efficiency um and i'm well my question isn't for Anne, but it's inspired by Anne. um <laughs> you showed the uh, graphic that i love that's got kind of a huge disparity between CHP deployment to date, I think in blue, and then the potential in green. And there's, you know, like I said, there's a huge disconnect. There's clearly a lot of like, additional opportunity out there. Um, but the prevailing theme from everyone was that it's kind of a lack of education. People know more about CHP, they want to see how great this is, and they do what's of course needed. Um, I'd be interested in hearing folks' perspective, and I'm thinking maybe Dale would be best equipped to address this. Um, we're on the hill, what could be done in Congress to help reduce, yeah, help realize some of the growth potential. And others can just certainly don't as well. Well, I think that's that's exactly what we're grappling with right now is what is the, what are the, the issues. That's why we're having a, frankly, we're having this meeting now and at the meeting tomorrow so we can better understand how to communicate this, <laughs> these, the, the barriers that the industry faces and how to build support for for breaking down the barriers and moving forward and i'm, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm sort of just mystified sometimes by why why it is a continuing con continuing problem and i'm not that it's, it's it's an issue that that's confusing because we we have all these advantages that it's out there as an industry yet somehow it's it, we seem to be always going back to square one someone's asking we're, we're back it's been around for a long time. They've been working on the issue for a long time. It's been out there, but but it, it, we're having a hard time getting the market to, 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 to respond to the stimuli that we're trying to get out there. I, I, I don't know. Like I said, that's what we're here. We're having a meeting tomorrow to try to get our arms around better about what our next step should be. If anybody has any other thoughts? Or Tom, were you going to? Go ahead. Um, I don't, I don't, oh, this is on. Um, you know, I think that uh, one of the main barriers, and, and you know, we had a, one of the first questions, I, I think it's really great to hear about 
you know, Sikorsky and, and how they uh, were able to have a good relationship with their utility. Um, that is not always the case. And so we, we actually have seen that as being a pretty big uh, barrier for a lot of these systems. Um, you know, utilities uh, and, and the kind of whole utility industry is, is pretty entrenched in the way it works. And so I think as, you know, any type of, of process, when you're trying to change the status quo, it's not going to be easy. Um, and so I think that's where CHP is, is that, you know, Utilities are, are used to operating a certain way. Um, they're being forced now, uh, in many cases, to have energy efficiency programs, uh, which is great. Uh, but you know, it's it. As a business, I understand. I, I don't want to sell less of my products. I, I I get it. You know, but at the same time, I think there needs to be. You know, we have to figure out this balance between. Um, you know you know, having utilities be supportive of things that are better for their customers, you know, having, I think it's, it's good for them, you know, to say, hey, Sikorsky, we're going to work with you because we want to keep you as a customer or we want to keep you in our state uh, instead of having you go somewhere else where they could either self-generate or they could get lower, uh, you know, electricity and thermal prices. So, you know, especially being somewhere in, like in Connecticut, they don't have the lowest prices in the country. So if that's a, you know, a big driver in their costs, um, you know, so there is a, a push and pull there. And so there has been some uh, legislation that's come out that, or kind of proposals that uh, are kind of seeking to, to address this. But I think it is, you know, at the state regulatory level that, you know, uh, regulating their utilities in the state, and even just, you know, some, some federal action that could be taken to push them in the in this way that's saying, you know, this is a, a technology that should be uh, promoted and if it doesn't fit in that uh, energy efficiency bucket, it doesn't fit in the renewable bucket, maybe it needs its own bucket and we can, you know, move forward with that. Okay, Tom? I'd like to uh, um, second what Ann just said. Uh, there, uh, we are making progress, I think, at the utility interface, but there are still a lot of challenges at the utility interface as well. And perhaps we need to work on some alternative business models or some, some uh, uh, procedures, uh, methods and procedures to let the utilities uh, have more of a stake here. Uh, one thing I would add, though, is I, I think we have seen, and uh, this is Connecticut, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never uh, seen anything like, there was, there was a period of time when they kind of put a, a multi-pronged approach where they waived uh, 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 the standby tariff, they removed the standby tariff, they uh, reduced, they waived the T&D gas charges and just charged commodity rates for gas, they instituted a low interest loan program, they paid the site owner an incentive for installing CHP. They paid the utility an incentive for $200 per kW. So they came at it from five different directions. And consequently, uh, I believe in a 30-month period, there were 81 applications for more than 300 megawatts in that one state. So, you know, I think, and, 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 it, and it did come around, uh, it was all coalesced around uh, a T&D congestion need, uh, which was the rationale for it. And I think that it, it was one of the measures that did help serve that need. So I think we can get there, but I think maybe it's a multi-pronged, multifaceted approach and also one that brings the utilities in uh, much more closely as partners. Did you want to comment, Bob, or anything? Okay, yeah, which is, which is really interesting in terms of looking at utilities, looking at PUCs as players in terms of everybody looking at what the, the issues are, the problems are that how they could be resolved and um, so that all the players are brought together, um, which does make sense and in terms of trying to figure out also where there are gaps. I think that someone also mentioned about various states have efficiency programs or renewable programs where CHP falls through the cracks where it's just not eligible for any of that and that therefore um, uh, of course, why would anybody look at that where they're, it's not part of the policy that they're playing with? So there were a couple other questions out here. Okay, Bob first and then. Is there anyone here from HUD? <laughs> I had a friend the combined heat and power program at HUD until I retired a couple of years ago. And it's been, uh, it was a struggle then 
to uh, keep up interest. Uh, we were encouraged by the Northeast. I only found about eight states where there was multifamily cogeneration uh, combined heat and power. And I was wondering, Anne, on your lists that you maintain at ICF, of whether the multifamily <coughs> sector has increased uh, A, among the states, the eight, and B, whether there are any new states uh, that are turning up because uh, gas prices are down or other economic factors have changed. What's the future? Yeah, we're definitely seeing a lot more action in a, in a lot more states. Um, in, in the past, traditionally, there have been uh, very kind of isolated pockets of the country that unless you're a very large industrial and you kind of have those economies of scale, it's harder on you know the smaller ones. If, if you have a, a multifamily building or if you're a small hospital, it's been harder to make the economics work. Uh, that situation is changing in a lot of states mainly because uh, we continue to see electric prices increase and uh, gas prices now are, are much lower than they were several years ago. Um, you know, so yes, we've definitely seen some, some increases in multifamily. Uh, I think there are, you know, there are certain applications like that that tend to be very uh, regionally focused because there are certain developers uh, that are, are used to working with a certain application. Uh, and they're located in, in, you know, the Northeast especially has, has a, a big uh, market. So, um, you know, I, I think for multifamily, it's continuing to grow. I, I don't know if it's at the pace we'd like to see yet, but we keep seeing a lot of um, really uh, kind of exciting things for the future. Okay, uh, last question. Okay. Uh, David Payton with the Vermeer Corporation. There's been a lot of discussion about gas as a fuel source. What are the prospects for wood as a fuel source? So I think the best example still is uh, Paul, Coach, and uh, what are the prospects for wood facilities that drive most much smaller like the plant Well, uh, again, speaking for the Northeast, we do definitely see interest in places like Vermont, New Hampshire, some parts of Massachusetts, Maine, uh, for wood biomass-based systems. It does, you know, there are some good opportunities there, and there's some good examples of projects there, including a, a hospital uh, and some other hospitals interested as well. And you just mentioned district systems. I know there's interest in, in uh, both thermal and thermal slash electric uh, district systems that are biomass based in in, uh, in many parts of, of New England and, and in upstate New York. So yes, indeed, there is definitely an interest where the resource is available. Um, and I might just mention that Rob Thornton, who is the president of uh, International District Energy Association, is also here. So that if it, I, um, I know that he could also speak to specific projects um, that have been going on with regard to those systems as well. Rob, I'm just okay. The state of Vermont is building a biomass district energy facility um, in, the, in the capital and the, and the city of um, city. Uh, what's the capital city of Vermont again? Okay. Yeah. Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Vermont. Um, so the state, so the city is actually building the heating network to supply uh, district heating to you know a, a dozen or so buildings. One of the things that happened with biomass in the last you know, few years, particularly in Massachusetts, was a Manomet study, uh, and it kind of put a chill on biomass <coughs> electricity only. And really what it's now pointing to is, is greater efficiency, which means recovering the heat. Uh, and so now we're starting to see legislation where biomass is going to have to be at 60, 70% efficiency, which means you can't throw the heat away. You've got to really use it. So you know, we see the trend for smaller scale systems where there's a, you know, a significant thermal load and you can really capture all the efficiency. Okay. Can I, can I just add one thing? We looked at uh, uh, biomass as we started our engineering study uh, at Sikorsky and it was sourcing the biomass material a, a, a good sustainable supply. Uh, we did have some that we generated but we knew that we would just exceed that uh, rapidly but our system uh, as we look at our aircraft systems we look at multiple redundancy and as we're trying to harden our infrastructure, 
We have a dual fuel system. It's uh, number two fuel oil as well as gas. It runs on gas. But if something happens, if the gas system is interrupted, we can flip over in a few minutes right to oil. So we looked at biomass as possibly being that other alternative fuel. But it was sourcing, especially in our region, that, that became the issue. I would like to thank you all very, very much for being here. And again, the presentations and the video will, for the briefing will be up on our website. And so if you've got questions for any of the speakers, uh, please feel free to contact them or to let us know, and we will try to get you the answers to questions. And please let your colleagues know about this, too, because I think there's so much important information um, that, that was given to us today that we should try to follow up on. Thank you very, very much for being here. And I want to thank our wonderful, wonderful panel for their terrific presentations. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.